Okay, if I can get your attention, we'll get started. Uh, today we need to run class very efficiently. Today, among other things, is a review for the exam. And so, if we can keep things running clockwork, then we'll maximize the time for the review for the exam. If we get behind on things, then that might only be like 10 or 15 minutes. But I'd like to give you more chances to ask me clarifying questions in advance of next Tuesday's exam. Uh, before we get started, though, we'll have Sarah Garrett, who's a, a, a uh, outstanding graduate student in the sociology department. We'll be making a research-related announcement and appeal for research-related help. Um, so, Sarah. Hi, um, I'm gonna make this brief because I know you guys have uh, a lot to cover today, but I am starting out a dissertation project on the transition to first-time parenthood. I'm looking at social networks and cultural factors as they shape the experience. And I've been trying to talk to obstetricians locally, but I don't have any personal contacts. And it turns out they're super busy, they're hard to get a hold of, I'm making very little headway. So I'm actually appealing to you guys, trying to use my social capital, or Rob's more specifically, to see if any of you are local, or you have a local family, um, and if any of them are obstetri obstetricians. Um, so if you have anyone who's related to you, who you're close with, who you think would be willing to talk to a grad student working on a project about how parents work through this transition, uh, please email me. My email address is right here, or email Professor Willer. Um, I greatly appreciate any leads you have, and you know, either you can email me the content information, or I can just send you more information about the project, uh, whatever works best for you, and I appreciate it. So have a great class. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, if any of you do have uh, contacts that would be helpful to Sarah in her research, please do let her know. Her email, if you can't read it, is sbgarrett at berkeley.edu, two R's, two T's, and uh, you can email me also, and I'll forward your email to Sarah, should you be interested in helping out or able to. A uh, couple things before we get started. I, it turned out somebody brought to my attention that I actually didn't finish the social identity theory lecture. The uh, slides are all available online, they're complete, but I didn't totally finish like the last three slides. That's the lecture that ends with the Robbers Cave experiment, uh, and you all were like shuffling your bags, and I was like trying really quickly to like get through the part where they buy the malteds for one another. Do y'all remember this? A very, very sweet ending. As it turns out, that's not the ending of that lecture. Uh, so let's very quickly cover the end of that lecture, and then we'll uh, finish the status lecture, and then we'll do the midterm or the midterm review uh, after the break. So here, what's wrong? Is something wrong? Or am I just talking? Okay, just talking. Okay, I thought something went wrong. I'm, I'm reassuring you all just talking. <laughs> okay, so Robert's Cave Experiment. Oh, by the way, people point things out to me over email. They correct me on things. Sometimes they're little things. I don't bring them to class. Sometimes they're big things. A big thing. I apparently said that Grease and Geese is a movie. I said that in the last lecture. It is not a movie. It's a television show. It's weird I said that because it's like my favorite television show of all time. And if you haven't seen it, I highly encourage that you do so. Uh, if you do, then you'll automatically get an A-plus in class. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, I'm kidding. I don't like that much. Okay, if I get your attention, if I get your attention. Okay, so let's wrap up the social identity theory lecture. So where we left off, you all were trying to leave, and I was talking about the end of the Robbers Cave experiment. And at the end of the Robbers Cave experiment, uh, let's see here, what happened? They, they brought these people together, these groups, the Rattlers and the Eagles, who had previously hated one another, and had them work on common tasks together. And among these common tasks were, they had to, what they do? Uh, they had to work on non-trivial problems, including the water problem, where the Vandals had cut off the water supply for the, for the entire uh, summer camp. And they also had to go get a movie. It required more money than either group had alone. And uh, they did, you know, a few other things, like they had to cut down a dangerous tree or something like that, and uh, they had to get a truck that was stuck in the mud, out of the mud, or else they couldn't get the supplies from the nearby town, so they could eat that night. Uh, basically, the camp counselors and the experimenters set up these clever little situations that would force them to have to come together and cooperate. And in coming together and cooperating, the groups came to love one another, which is very sweet. They ate together, uh, they sat together uh, voluntarily at dinner. <clears throat> No, that's redundant. Eating together and mixing together, that's the same thing. Uh, they decided that they wanted to return to Oklahoma City on one bus instead of two at the end, and then they cheered when the staff said, okay, sure, you can do that. And then they sat together on the bus, you know, uh, eagles next to rattlers, loving one another. And then at the rest stop on the way back, the rattlers decided to spend the $5 they'd won in the bean tossing contest um, on malted ice cream shakes for everybody. Do you all know what those are, malted ice cream shakes? They're very good. They were big in the 50s. Okay. Um, so that, I mean, that's how, how deeply connected they were. They actually shared ice cream with one another. And if you've ever seen like Eddie Murphy's Delirious, you know what a rare thing I did for children to share ice cream. Uh, okay. So it's like, it'd be like adults giving money to one another. It's like that rare of a thing. So, Okay, so conclusions. Uh, separation and competition between groups can generate intergroup conflict, but then cooperative pursuit of common goals and shared success in uh, tackling those goals can then foster solidarity, cohesion, and liking. And this is actually a graph from uh, the Sh oh man, what? Okay, this is a graph from the Sharif's uh, actual study, which shows that before these are the, this is the rate of eagles having best friends that are rattlers and the rate of rattlers having best friends that are eagles. I love that these kids thought they were just going to summer camp and then it turns into these bar graphs like seven years later in social psych classes. How weird is that? Uh, so uh, less than 10% of them had friend best friends in the other group, but then uh, you know by the end after the, the integration period was over, they worked on the common tasks and then brought together. Uh, by this time, eagles at a very high rate, over well, above 20%, is a doubling of the rate best friends uh, in the other group. And you can even see the end of this bar because it's so enormous. You don't even know where it ends. And indeed, we don't know where it ends. It's just joy and love and best friends forever. Um, actually, it's 35% is what this one is. Uh, so it goes a little bit past there. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so there's this increased rate of having best friends in the other group because they, they came to really like the other group. So some conclusions about social identity theory and intergroup conflict that comes out of this lecture we did like weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Um, okay, so one, the accentuation effect helps explain outgroup stereotyping. If you remember, the accentuation effect was a tendency to see objects of any sort, be they humans or, or even just immaterial objects, to see them uh, when they're presented as being in different groups, as being very similar within the groups, and then very different between the groups. That all you need to do is just have some objects presented as in different groups, and then you'll tend to say, oh, they're about the same in the group, and they're very different between the groups. It's this kind of natural human tendency called the accentuation effect, and it's one of the reasons that we have uh, outgroup stereotyping in humans, right? Because you think I'm in my group, we must all be pretty similar. They're in their group, they're all about the same, and they're very different from me, or, or rather us. Also, the minimal group experiments show that you can make a group out of even trivial differences, like taste and abstract art, and that people will allocate more resources to their in-group, and uh, then they will the out-group. They'll try to maximize the difference between in-group and the out-group, uh, because uh, even trivial bases of group differentiation, like Eagles, Rattlers, Kandinsky versus Klimt's painting preferences, can trigger group competition. Also, this Milgram replication where they manipulated in the experiment whether the target of the shocks was white or African American uh, shows that group differences can create even violence towards the outgroup uh, when, that, when that difference in that group differentiation is made salient. And then the soccer study, the Levine et al. study, uh, showed that people help in-group members more than out-group members, but it also showed that what you define as your in-group is heavily contextual. It's highly
Okay, uh, so other conclusions based on the social identity theory lecture. Research on student groups at UCLA shows that they promote, uh, that student groups at UCLA anyway promote within group identification, uh, reduce common identity across groups, and foster also uh, perceptions of intergroup persecution. Uh, and also the Robert's Cave experiment, perhaps the best experiment that we talked about this semester, uh, or sorry, in this section of the class. I, everybody loves the Robert's Cave experiment because it's rich with qualitative observations about the nature of intergroup conflict. The Robert's Cave experiment shows that pursuing a common goal creates group identification, and then group competition can create intergroup animosity, but then a common goal at the end and cooperation across groups can also unite groups. I've now said that three times, so that should be clear. And for some reason, I guess I didn't make that yellow, so you probably didn't see any of that. Uh, so I encourage you to download the slides uh, off of BeatSpace so you can see what I was just talking about. Okay, are there any questions about the social identity theory about this material? Okay, so let's wrap up the status lecture. And where were we on the status lecture? We had just finished talking about research on the motherhood penalty, which showed that motherhood is a basis of status differentiation in our society. And mothers in the, in the labor market are presumed to be less competent and less committed to their jobs. And this is demonstrated both through laboratory experiments, but also a field experiment that was conducted with real employers in New York City, uh, where they mail out applications and saw the rate of callbacks they would get. And they find that women who are mothers, even if you control for everything else about them, about their resumes, about their qualifications, they tend to do much worse. But then women, uh, or sorry, men who have to be parents, men who are fathers, as compared with men who are not, they do better. Uh, they actually improve in terms of how uh, the salaries are offered, the rates of promotion uh, that, are, that are reported by subject and study interest from New York City employers in hiring them. They actually do better. And why is that? Well, I was offering you a possible explanation that maybe the generally positive stereotype of men in the labor market, uh, or, or impression of men, we'll talk about stereotypes after, the, after this exam, but whatever. Uh, this, this generally positive impression of men in the labor market is not perfectly positive. There's some things that maybe we don't trust about men, or they're really competitive or sexually ambitious, or maybe we'll leave this firm and jump to another. But then when they're fathers, it counteracts a lot of those, those few demerits uh, in that generalized impression of men in the labor market. Okay. So moving on, uh, more research on status-based discrimination before we turn to a study on how status can integrate groups. So how many people here are familiar with Eva Pager's research on racial discrimination in the labor market? Okay, so many, many, many of you. Okay, so nonetheless, I'll try and build it up from the, from the beginning and, and set up the problem that she was trying to answer for, uh, for those of you who don't know Eva Pager's work. So Eva Pager started with a, with a fundamental question, which is, does discrimination persist in the U.S. job market or in labor market? And specifically, does racial discrimination persist in the U.S. labor market? We know that it did 50, 60 years ago, but it's hotly debated now whether or not it, it persists, whether there's still discrimination. I know a lot of you are like, really? That's hotly debated now? Yes, it actually is. So many people, many academics say, no, there is no more discrimination left in America. The labor market now functions on an almost purely meritocratic basis, where people are sized up based on their credentials. They're not perfectly evaluated, but uh, people don't rely on things like race and gender as cues of competence or as bases of discrimination. So uh, especially uh, economists who study labor markets tend to claim that discrimination can't exist because it would be eliminated by market forces. And their argument is, is elegant, I think. So their argument for why discrimination doesn't exist is, is that if you have a firm A and you have a firm B, and firm A discriminates and doesn't hire African Americans, doesn't hire women uh, or, or, or homosexuals who are equally qualified or more qualified sometimes, right, than uh, their white male counterparts, then overall this firm is going to have a relatively incompetent labor force compared to this firm that does hire just the most available applicants, best available applicants, right? So if this firm is going to hire women, going to hire members of minority races, they're going to do better in the long term, and this firm, firm B, the one that is egalitarian, will win out in the course of uh, labor market competition. And firm A should either waste away and die away, uh, go bankrupt, what have you, or switch their strategy in order to keep up with firm B. Can those of you in the very back there stop talking, please? Very back, right? You're paying so little attention. You don't even know what I'm pointing to. There you go. Okay. Firm B should do better and eliminate Firm A from the, or at least force Firm A to switch their strategy to an egalitarian hiring one because it's a better business. So economists say, based on this reasoning, it is therefore impossible that discrimination persists in the labor market despite abundant empirical evidence that it does. Uh, it's theoretically impossible, therefore you must deny the empirical data uh, facts before you. It's a very clever argument. Sociologists point to data that shows women still make less money than men, blacks make less money than uh, whites, and Latinos do as well, and so on. And they say, well, sure, you make this theoretical argument, but the evidence says otherwise. So, many, but there's many answers to the data that the sociologists present, to be fair to the economists' side. The sociologists are presenting these data, and it could be that other things explain the differences. Uh, economists say maybe uh, whites really are more credentialed for whatever reason, or maybe uh, men, because they don't have to take stays out of the workforce to have children, or they take less time to nurture children, then maybe that's a critical uh, step where women leave the workforce and then, and then don't accumulate credentials where men do. And if you accommodate, if you, if you account for that, then you wouldn't have much of a gender wage gap anymore. So, it's a hotly debated issue, and indeed, no side has a slam dunk answer on this, on whether uh, discrimination exists or not. Um, because it's, it's really, really, really hard to demonstrate. So who's right in this argument? And let's specifically talk about racial discrimination. I would argue that what's most needed is an experiment, right? You want an experiment where you hold everything constant, except you can manipulate the race of a job applicant, and then see when they have a certain race, do they get allocated a higher salary, higher chance of promotion, better chance of getting a job, or what have you, then when they have another race. This is the perfect answer to this question, right? You're curious if the independent variable, if the independent variable has an effect on the dependent variable, then manipulate the independent variable while holding constant all other independent variables, all confounding variables, and see if it has an effect on the dependent variable. So what you could do is you could take two job applicants with identical credentials, but one is white and the other is black, and ask and just you know study whether the white applicant will be more likely to get the job. Um, I don't know why that was similar to the volume also. Oh yeah, in a complicated way on time. Okay. I'm sorry, yeah, it is similar. It's, yeah, I do not have time to explain that at a subtle point. Okay. Uh, Dio Pager has conducted several audit studies essentially doing that. Now, what's an audit study? An audit study is it's a term where you want to audit like a company or an institution and see whether it's discriminatory or not by sending in uh, you know, applicants for housing or a job or what have you, and then you manipulate, you keep their credentials control, but manipulate some characteristic uh, that relates to discrimination like their race. And so that, I know, we call them audit studies because they originated with the government auditing certain institutions with this research practice trying to see well, are you discriminating or not. So experimental studies, so she ran a series of experimental studies where Confederates actually applied for jobs in order to, to study uh, to, to discover whether or not there was racial discrimination. And this is the most recent study. So Dio Pager had Confederates apply for real low-wage jobs in New York City. And when they went to apply for these low-wage jobs, Jobs at McDonald's or Walmart, what have you, they reported identical qualifications. They turned in their resumes, they said, This is, you know, these are my qualifications, they were identical. Um, and then they would furthermore, oh man, you can't see all of that? Oh no, you can, okay, you can see essentially all of it. Man, I don't know what that was. Um, okay, yeah, so she had people apply for, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> So they reported essentially identical qualifications and applied to the exact same employers, but they varied, she varied whether the applicants were white, black, or Latino. And then other things you know, would come up, like they would ask you spontaneous questions, like, you know, uh,
Well, in the first, in the first study, white, black, and Latino competitors apply for jobs, and they looked at the rate of positive responses, like the rate of callbacks. Cases where employers said, yeah, you look promising, you know, please come back for a second interview, maybe we'll give you the job, then we'll just ask you more questions. And here were the results, the rate of positive responses. Whites received a positive response 23% of the time, Latinos 90, 19% of the time, and blacks 30% of the time. This would seem like pretty strong evidence that People of minority races in the contemporary U.S. do face disadvantages in the low-wage labor market, at least in New York City. Um, these people were acting exactly the same. The only different was phenotypic, what they look like, the color of their skin. Any questions about this? Okay. So then, Diva Major ran another study following this up. And she was interested in what's the magnitude of this effect? Like, how bad is the effect for being a minority in the United States when it comes to applying for low-wage jobs? How extreme is the penalty? Does it compare, for example, to being a felon? If you were to look at, if you were to compare the job application success of a white person who was fresh out of prison for some felony, how would that compare with the job market success of blacks and Latinos? So she reran the prior study with uh, now the white person when he or she, I don't remember if they, if they tried both genders or not. It may just be men, or it might be women, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the white person on the job application, remember, you know how like, on the job application they always ask you if you're if you've been in prison or committed some felony, it's a federal law that, that has to be on all job applications so the employers can know this. Um, I know you know this because you're always having to fill stuff into that box. Um, so the white, uh, the white felon received a 13% positive response rate, you know, not that high, but then he is, you know, fresh out of prison. And then uh, Latinos are 14%, like about the same, blacks 10%, about the same, not statistically different from 13%. Uh, and, but this is kind of a stunning result, right? The, the difference between, uh, there's really no difference between being a white felon and applying for a low-wage job and being a, a non-felon, not fresh out of prison, uh, but being guilty of being Latino or black. Uh, so there were also the qualitative data around this was very rich and very interesting. Uh, there was uh, examples of employers selling black applicants that they were looking for just a different kind of person. They couldn't even put their finger on it necessarily. And one wonders if they did know what it was about the applicant that they didn't like, um, the person was African American and they just didn't want to tell the person, or maybe they didn't even know. You know, maybe they didn't even know and they just were like, wow, this person isn't exactly the person I want to work with. You know, this isn't exactly the job applicant I was hoping for. But then in some of these examples, they would hire an identical white applicant who was fresh out of prison the exact same day. Uh, there was another case of one of the Confederates going to apply for a job, taking a bus to the site of the, of the job, and uh, well, waiting, oh, no, waiting at the bus stop afterwards to go back home or back to whatever university they're from, like Princeton or something. And they, uh, they're waiting at the bus stop, and this guy, this African American guy, uh, came to them and was like, uh, you know, I don't know why you apply for a job there, but knows that they want People, you know? And they were like, oh, well, academia doesn't know that, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> so, but I mean, a lot of people be like, oh, that guy's a kook or something. You know, he's just paranoid or something, but he had it exactly right. And that, and that exact employer did not hire uh, that confederate, but did hire a white, or a white confederate who applied uh, a couple days later. Okay, so the Pages research offers strong evidence in support of the claim that racial discrimination persists in the low-wage labor market. That research was done just like two years ago. We have little reason to think that it would all be very different. Um, so, yeah, so there were also oh, other qualitative things. Several examples. They found several examples of employers channeling black and Latino applicants into lower status jobs and whites into higher status jobs. So white uh, and black Confederates would come and apply for the same job, and the white applicant would be told, oh, you know, you'd be good for this job. You might want to apply for an even better job, you know? And the black applicants would be told, well, yeah, you'd be okay in this job, but you might want to apply actually to be, uh, you know, the janitor in this office or something. Uh, and so being black in the low-wage labor market was about as difficult dependent employment as being fresh out of prison. Latinos faced less discrimination than blacks, but were still disadvantaged relative to whites despite identical qualifications and did not receive much better job prospects than a white felon. Uh, questions? Yes. No on felons, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So oh yeah, did I mean like felon, felon, felon? No, just white felons compared to Latinos and blacks. Yeah. They aren't they aren't felons, yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. I believe they tracked it statistically. Um, yeah, because there could be a concern that maybe Maybe, maybe that would be somehow confounded with manipulation, where uh, applicants of a certain race would be channeled into a certain kind of uh, interviewer or something at the same job site, and then that the, it's really a race of interviewer effect or something like that. Um, I think they track that. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. It's possible that's manipulation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And to be clear, these employers, some of them are white, many of them are white, but you know, many of them are not white as well. Uh, so in a way, this is an example of how uh, status beliefs tend to be shared across uh, a general culture. You know, and it, we shouldn't be surprised to see that it isn't just white employers that might discriminate uh, against minority job applicants. Other questions? Yes. What's that? Say again? Oh, yeah, what they do afterwards, I think what they did was they never accepted a job, but they got a call back, they didn't return the call, and then they mailed, like, they didn't want to disrupt the hiring process, and then they mailed them, like, you know, a debriefing note later that was like, you were in this guy, you didn't know it, we had sent a couple people to apply for a job a month ago, and stuff like that. So they tried to minimize the harm to the employers, though it is certainly possible the employers were slowed a little bit in filling positions that they were, like, really excited about somebody, because their strategy was just don't, don't return any phone calls. Which is kind of funny to think about. Um, but yeah, yeah, okay, other questions? Okay. Okay, so now we talked about ways in which status differentiate people and drives people apart and can be a basis of discrimination in the lowest labor market, in the white collar labor market, in everyday life, in test taking situations, and so on. And I want to convince you that status is one of the fundamental ways in which, to, uh, or one of the fundamental bases of discrimination. After the exam, we're going to talk about other bases of discrimination and stereotyping, which are subtly different. They're conceptualized somewhat differently. Stereotyping is an overlapping idea with status, but not exactly the same. But what I want to try and explain to you now is ways in which status maybe brings individuals together. And if you remember, early on I said that there were some bases of status differentiation in groups that you might think of as fair. You know, uh, there's ones that are obviously unfair. We, we shouldn't probably judge the confidence of somebody based on their gender or their race because you should judge people as individuals if you want to get a, a, a reliable and valid assessment of how smart they are, how honest they are, and so on. But there's some more meritorious bases of status, and, and those exist as well. And they have similar effects in terms of determining respect for people, perceptions of competence of people, the influence of people have, but they're the kind of criteria that we wouldn't look down upon so much. Things like uh, intelligence, education, honesty, generosity. And specifically, in this part of the lecture, I want to talk to you about the relationship between generosity and status. And in order to do this, and here I'm talking about some of my research, actually, so uh, don't criticize any of what follows, please. No, in actuality, I, I'm not at all sensitive about that stuff, so feel free to tear into the research of the ideas as you see fit. Um, so uh, the idea here 